Hi, everyone, and welcome to uh, our grand rounds today. I'd like to introduce Dr. Van Epps. Dr. Van Epps is an assistant professor in the Department of Internal Medicine within the Division of Infectious Diseases and HIV Medicine at the Case Western Reserve School of Medicine. She received her medical degree from Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine in 2007. She went on to receive her internal medicine training at University Hospital's Case Medical Center. During her residency training, she received the Carpenter Award for Clinical Excellence. She went on to complete an infectious disease fellowship at Case. There she developed an interest in the, the immunobiology of aging during her first year of ID training and successfully completed for trainee funding via an NIH-sponsored institutional award, the T32, in uh, aging immunology. Puja transitioned into faculty with a joint appoint appointment in the GREC and the infectious disease section at uh, Lewis Stokes in 2013. She has continued to make contributions in aging and vaccine immunology, and her current efforts include clinical efficacy study examining high-dose flu vaccine versus adjuvanted flu vaccine in nursing home adults. She also has an interest in HIV and its prevention. Her current work includes harnessing the power of big data for HIV prevention research and clinical improvement projects in persons living with HIV. Beyond her research interests, Dr. Van Ness is valued for her contribution to the education of students and trainees. She has received recognition letter from the Vice Dean of Education, Dr. Pat Thomas, at the School of Medicine, a nomination for Educator of the Year Award in 2017 by the Internal Medicine Residents. For faculty, she is a sought-after speaker and has shared her expertise at multiple venues locally, regionally, and nationally. Please welcome Dr. Van Epps today for Grand Rounds. Thank you, Charlie, for that great introduction, um, and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to provide this, I think, very timely update on the Zoster vaccine. Um, let's see if I can... All right, so here are my objectives for today. Um, I will begin by kind of giving a brief overview of clinical presentation and epidemiology of herpes zoster, and then delve into what uh, mechanisms do we have of preventing herpes zoster. Um, there's really two vaccines that are currently available, and I will review the uh, data behind both of them, the zoster vaccine live, and the new kit on the block, the uh, subunit vaccine, Shingrix, or HCSU. And then we'll talk about some of the clinical considerations that are bound to come up once people start using this vaccine, um, and hopefully we can answer some of those questions and briefly kind of mention what's on the horizon for herpes zoster prevention. It's a very, very um, active area um, at this time. So just a uh, sort of brief reminder of pathophysiology of herpes zoster. As you all know, varicella zoster virus can cause two distinct uh, diseases. Um, so the primary infection is varicella or chickenpox that uh, typically occurs in children. Once that infection occurs, the VZV virus can um, form latent infection in the dorsal root ganglia near the spinal cord. Reactivation of this virus in, within um, that dorsal root ganglia is called shing shingles or zoster, and it presents with this very characteristic dermatomal um, rash that we are all very familiar with. So what is the epidemiology? So the annual rate of herpes zoster is about four cases per 1,000, which translates to about a million cases in the United States annually. Um, it is certainly as um, people age, they're more likely to get zoster, such that uh, rate of zoster in children is actually very low, less than one per 1,000 children, to up to 15 cases per 1,000 for those who are 80-year-old. Um, any given person has a one in three um, chance of getting um, herpes zoster. So there's a one in three chance of lifetime risk of herpes zoster. And people who are over the age of 85, they're 50 percent. Um, they have a 50 percent risk of developing herpes zoster at some point. So the older you get, the more likely you are to have it. This is data depicting the rates of herpes zoster over the last two decades, and the reason why this is sort of important to consider is that it takes into account the effect of the varicella vaccine, or Varivax, which became available for children in 1995. So if you look at the, um, the graph here on the left, the very top line is older than 65, and what has happened to the rate is that it was um, going up un until the mid 2000s it's uh, plateaued since that time. For all the other age groups other than children, the incidence of herpes zoster is actually still rising. There is not a good explanation behind why this rate is still rising, and there's also not a good explanation as to why this rate in older than 65 has plateaued. 
It is not related to the um, Zasta vaccine uh, rates because, as I'll show you, the uptake of that vaccine has been actually fairly poor. And um, around this time, it was probably around 15% nationally. And then if you look at children, there's been a decline since about 2005 in rates of herpes zoster. And this graph looks at, um, at children age stratified. And you can see as more and more birth cohorts got the varicella vaccine, um, the rates of herpes zoster begin to drop. So these kids, they have never been exposed to um, wild type uh, VZB, so they're less likely to get herpes zoster. And then there's uh, less circulating VZB in the population. Um, so again, less chance of getting herpes zoster. So in, the chil in children, the rates have been declining. In over 65, they've plateaued and the rest they're rising. There are really two primary risk factors for developing herpes zoster, older age and immune suppression. So essentially, anything that will lead to a decrease in your cell-mediated immunity, so either having to do with age or having to do with immune suppression related to chemotherapy or other therapeutics, um, it leads to an increased risk of having VZV reactivation. So the age um, is, is really a primary risk factor in driving herpes zoster incidence. And what you can see from this graph, this is uh, data from MarketScan, which is an administrative database of insured uh, uh, persons in the United States. And what you can see is right at age 50, there's a very sharp increase in, in herpes zoster incidence. And this becomes relevant when we talk about the vaccine and what the indications for, for age are. How does it present about? 90% of herpes zoster presents with uh, an acute neuritis type picture. In the vast majority of presentations, the pain will actually precede the rash. And sometimes we run into this um, um, sort of a diagnostic mystery where patients will present with a, with a neuritis type pain without a rash. Um, and uh, those can sometimes be a, a, a diagnostic dilemma. There is some uh, data to support um, that this is actually herpes zoster, as people have demonstrated that those patients who have that very classic dermatomal pain without rash have circulating VZV virus. Um, you know, a lot of us think of, um, a lot of people think of herpes zoster as a self-limited illness, but it can have a lot of uh, complications. Post-herpetic neuralgia is the most well-known complication of herpes zoster. You can have secondary bacterial infections, certainly ocular complications we see. Uh, meningitis, encephalitis, or um, herpes zoster oticus, or Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. So how does it present? It typically presents um, as a macular papular eruption in a dermatomal fashion. Usually the thoracic and lumbar dermatomes are most classically involved, and usually you'll see involvement of one to three adjacent dermatomes. The rash progresses then to these vesicles, um, and then eventually these form pustules and sort of crust over. So it's, um, it's sort of a progressive rash. It, the onset is anywhere from five to seven days, and it lasts typically from five to 25 days. Um, this is a uh, sort of a more severe rash, a more uh, feared complication of, of uh, herpes zoster. So involvement of the ophthalmicus branch of the trigeminal nerve can cause um, a vision-threatening uh, disease, uveitis or keratitis, and this is, these are very, very serious infections. Post-herpetic neuralgia is probably the most feared complication, I would say, of herpes zoster. It is defined as pain that lasts for more than 90 days after the rash has abated. Um, very minor, a few minority of patients will go on to develop post-herpetic neuralgia, so around 10 to 15 percent. However, older age, again, is associated with post-herpetic neuralgia, such that um, it's actually fairly rare in patients under the age of 50 to develop post-herpetic neuralgia. However, uh, patients over the age of 80 are much more likely to get post-herpetic neuralgia if they have herpes zoster. Um, disseminated zoster can occur in immunocompromised patients. So, uh, persons who are uh, either bone marrow transplant patients or patients with HIV, they have upwards of 50 times greater risk of getting herpes zoster. And they can have very severe disease, which can present as a disseminated rash, so they can have a cutaneous dissemination. They can also have um, uh, organ involvement, so organ involvement including uh, pneumonitis, hepatitis, myelitis, or encephalitis. And these are very, very uh, life-threatening conditions. <clears throat> 
So what do we have to uh, prevent this disease? As you are all familiar with, um, the single dose live attenuated vaccine, Zostavax or ZVL, became available in 2006, and we'll discuss the data behind that. And then this is the new vaccine, it's a two dose adjuvanted vaccine, which became available um, at the end of last year. So let's talk about ZVL first. It was licensed, as I said, in 2006. Um, it was licensed for use in uh, those over the age of 50. It is a live attenuated uh, virus chain. It's essentially the same OCA virus that's in the varicella uh, vaccine, just 50 times the titer of that, of that virus. ACIP recommends this vaccine for over the age of 60 instead of 50 as the FDA approved indication. And um, since it is a live vaccine, it's not indicated for use in any in immunocompromising conditions. So this is the study that got uh, ZVL uh, FDA approved. This is a this is called a shingles prevention study. This is a very large VA study of over 38,000 veterans through the VA uh, cooperative studies program. And what they did it was a randomized uh, placebo-controlled trial, and they had two primary objectives: um, herpes zoster prevention and post-herpetic neuralgia prevention. And basically, what you can see if you look at the overall efficacy of the vaccine. For uh, post-herpetic neuralgia, it was 67% and 51% overall uh, for, for prevention of herpes zoster. What's interesting is if you stratify that by decades of age then, is that you can very clearly see the older you get, the less the efficacious the vaccine is, such that those over the age of 80 have really a dismal response to this vaccine around 18%. Um, so this is this is the the study that got the vaccine FDA approved. This was another VA study uh, that looked at 50 to 59 year olds, and you can see it's a little bit better efficacy here, around 70 percent overall, uh, which is better than what we saw here, uh, which was 67 percent overall, but you know poor over the age of 70. So the vaccine is sort of modest efficacy. What about duration? Um, there are several studies that have looked at duration. Um, the first two are VA studies. I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. And the, uh, the other three are very big uh, observational studies from various uh, cohorts like the Kaiser Permanente and the Medicare cohort. So this is looking at duration of protection. The first four years are contributed by the shingles prevention study that I just mentioned. Uh, the uh, from year five through seven is a follow-on study called the short-term prevention uh, persistence study, and the uh, eight, eight through 11 is long-term persistence study. These are all follow-on studies of the same initial study. It was, it, you know, this study had a little bit of shortcoming. It didn't have um, controls. By the time this study was started, there weren't enough controls uh, left, so they had a modeled control. So there's some drawbacks to that. But what is very apparent here is that as, um, you know, as years go by following the receipt of this vaccine, the um, efficacy really, really drops. So you really don't have protection. By the time you're out here, by year nine, you really have negligible protection uh, from this vaccine. Um, this is combining data from the, the two studies that I mentioned and the observational cohorts. The only... Um, so the Kaiser, this is the Kaiser Permanente cohort. They had a, a little bit more favorable vaccine efficacy to start with, but look at what happens to duration of protection, almost negligible protection by year eight, um, even worse than what was seen in the randomized trials. <clears throat> so what about uptake? Um, Uptake of this vaccine has been actually fairly slow, uh, but steady. This is national data by the CDC. Um, so right now this data probably stands right around 30%. So 30% of eligible uh, uh, persons in the United States have received this vaccine. Um, our uptake is a little bit better at the VA. Uh, in our particular catchment area, at the end of last year, the uptake was around 44%. So 44% of veterans in our catchment area had received, or eligible veterans had received this vaccine. Some of the barriers that have been cited um, are cost related to this vaccine, storage and handling. It's a frozen uh, vaccine, so you require a freezer in the clinic. It is uh, reimbursed by Medicare Part D, uh, so that's been an issue in, in the private setting. Uh, there's lower prioritization, I think, generally for adult vaccines. 
and there's been some concerns about safety because it's a live vaccine and effectiveness, you know, rightfully so because of the data that I just showed you. So that brings me to the new kid on the block, the HCSU or the new subunit vaccine. So it's important to sort of consider the components of this vaccine uh, in order to kind of understand all of the data behind it. So it is a adjuvanted recombinant vaccine. What does that mean? So adjuvant is a um, either an immunostimulant or a pharmacologic agent that's added to the antigen to enhance an immune response. And recombinant vaccines are a good alternative to live vaccines because you can use them in, uh, in persons who are not persons who are immune compromised, and they usually produce a stronger immune response. So the components of this vaccine are the antigen, which is glycoprotein E, 50 micrograms of that. Glycoprotein E is the most abundant uh, antigen on the VZV uh, virion, and it is also the primary target of the VZV-specific CD4 T cells. So that's what, the, well, that's what makes you have that, the, the immune response. And then the other portion of it is a liposomal-based adjuvant system, which serves to enhance that immune response. And the adjuvant system used in this vaccine is ASO1B, and it has primarily two immunostimulants, MPL and um, saponin QS21. And basically what they do, MPL enhances humoral and cell-mediated immunity against this antigen, and saponin QS21 uh, is, uh, enhances TH1 uh, response as well as cytotoxic T cell response. So together, these two immunostimulants produce a very pro-inflammatory response and um, you know, boost, boost the immunity to this antigen when you give the vaccine. And we'll come back to this point when we discuss safety data. So what are some of the general use guidelines? It is recommended for use in immunocompetent adults over the age of 50. I will say that it's FDA approved for everybody, so regardless of whether you're immune, it's that word does not appear in the, in the FDA approval. So it's FDA approved for anyone over the age of 50 who's not allergic to the components of the vaccine. Um, there is as of yet no recommendation in the immunocompromised host, and we'll come back to this point. It does not require screening for chickenpox, as neither did VVL, by the way. Um, you don't have to ask your patient if they've had chickenpox. You certainly do not need to check their titers uh, before giving this vaccine. Uh, ACIP has made a preferential recommendation of uh, use of, uh, of ACSU over ZVL. This is very, very unprecedented. And this was actually the closest vote in the ACIP history. Eight um, members on the panel voted for it and seven voted against it. Um, if somebody's a vaccine nerd and has lots of time, watch the ACIP meetings. They're fun to watch. Um, all right, so it is a two-dose series, which is a difference from the ZVL uh, vaccine that we discussed. The recommendation currently is time zero and two months, so it's two months apart. Um, the longest you can go is six months apart. If the second dose is given less than four weeks, you have to repeat the, repeat the dose. However, if you've gone longer than six months to give the second dose, you do not need to repeat the dose. You do have to caution your patients that, you know, uh, it has not been studied for a duration longer than six months, the two dose, um, so they may be unprotected for a duration of time, but they can get the second dose whenever they come in. And two doses are necessary regardless of history of uh, herpes zoster or prior history of VBL. It is an intramuscular vaccine as opposed to subcutaneous, which was uh, the live vaccine. It is refrigerated, unlike the other vaccine, which was uh, frozen. It does need to be reconstituted, so it comes in the antigen and the adjuvant separately, and it does need to be reconstituted. Once you've reconstituted it, it has to be used within six hours. So if you're having a patient come in, you can't reconstitute it the day before, or you just you have to be a little bit time sensitive. All right, so what about efficacy? This is where this is a fantastic vaccine, right? So the efficacy data for this vaccine comes from two trials primarily, ZOE50 and ZOE70. They were essentially the same randomized clinical trials, but the data was presented separately. So this is data from ZOE50, and ZOE50 was held in like 18 different countries. Um, it had persons over the age of 50. They did exclude people who have had prior zoster or prior ZVL, um, and everyone in this trial was immunocompromised. 
So what did they find? Um, so if you look at overall efficacy in the herpes zoster, in the vaccine arm, they only had six cases of herpes zoster. The, me the mean time of follow-up was of around three years in the study. And then if you look at placebo, there was uh, 210 cases of herpes zoster. That gives a remarkable efficacy of around 97%, which is really astounding, especially if you think back to the ZVL data that I just presented. Then if you look at age stratified efficacy, again, very, very remarkable. And even in, the, even in those who are over the age of 60, um, has a remarkable efficacy of 98%, which is in stark contrast to uh, the live vaccines. This is data from ZOE 70, same trial, except everybody here was over the age of 70. Um, it had thousands of patients, and essentially <clears throat> the vaccine efficacy was similarly very high. So overall efficacy was around 90% in this age group. What is very remarkable is in those over the age of 80, you still have a, get a very high vaccine efficacy of 90%. And if you recall okay. the data I presented about ZVL, the vaccine efficacy in this age group was 18%. So big difference. All right, what about post herpetic neuralgia? This is pool data from ZOE 50 and ZOE 70. Um, again, very efficacious in uh, prevention of post herpetic neuralgia. This is, um, if you just look at those over the age of 70, efficacy is right around um, uh, 90%. 90 as very similar to herpes zoster prevention. Remarkably, there were no cases of, her, uh, of post herpetic neuralgia from 50 to 70 years um, uh, age groups in this study. And then over the age of 80, there were no cases of post herpetic neuralgia in the control groups. So this looks bad, but good efficacy. All right, so what about duration of protection? Um, we only have data up to four years, unlike ZVL, where I showed you data going up to 11 years from the short-term and long-term persistent studies. So this is, uh, if you look at efficacy of the vaccine following receipt, one, two, three, four years, so it starts out with very high efficacy. There is a little bit of waning of immunity, but it kind of uh, plateaus around year three. So even at the end of, end of four years, uh, you still get pretty high, fairly high efficacy. There is some limited data beyond uh, four years. This was presented at uh, Infectious Diseases uh, Conference last year. And what they did, this is a very, very small study, 70 patients, but essentially they followed these patients uh, up to nine years. And what they're showing is CD4 specific T cell responses. And essentially what you should take away from that is that somewhere around year four, year three or four, the uh, protection kind of plateaus, and it stays at that level by year nine. So this line right here is still, you're above the uh, pre-vaccination immunity. One thing you have to remember is that there is no immune correlate of protection for herpes zoster. So how, what this, this translates into clinical efficacy, we don't know. This is unlike influenza, for instance, that does have an immune correlate. So if you compare side by side the duration of protection of these two vaccines, this top line is HZSU, this one is uh, ZVL, so this is the data that I initially presented from uh, all the three randomized uh, studies. You can see it starts out very high, there's a modest, you know, very mild decline and then it plateaus. This starts out sort of modest efficacy and there is really no protection when you get out here. Okay, so the vaccine is fantastic, but how safe is it? Um, so let's go back to the adjuvant system. This is where the safety data becomes relevant. So as I mentioned, this is a liposomal-based uh, uh, adjuvant system, ASO1B, and the way that it works is that it has these immunostimulants that really produce this uh, you know, remarkable pro-inflammatory response to help that antigen um, out with uh, both humoral and, and cell-mediated immunity. So because of this, you can expect that there's going to be some local reactions to the vaccine, right? Because you're having this massive inflammation um, related to the vaccine. So ASO1B has been used um, in other vaccine candidates as well. Obviously, the most data we have is from HCSU of about 28,000 uh, uh, subjects who have been vaccinated. 
There's also data in infants and children uh, with a malaria mm. vaccine a candidate. It's, uh, that adjuvant is ASO1E, which is a smaller dose of the adjuvant, but very similar. Um, and then this adjuvant is also in a candidate vaccine for uh, HIV, hepatitis B um, vaccine. So it's, it's, it's safe and it's been studied. All right, so let's talk about safety then. Um, so these are solicited local uh, symptoms, seven days post-vaccination. These are any grade. Uh, so as is very apparent, so the pink is data from Zoe 50, remember, uh, older than 50, and uh, the pink checkered is Zoe 70, which is older than 70, and blue is placebo. <laughs> and what you can see is that pain, redness, and swelling, very, very common. Upwards of 80% of patients had pain after getting this vaccine, around 40% redness and swelling. If you look at just grade three reactions and how they were defined in this study were for redness, if you have redness more than 100 millimeters, that was considered grade three. And for pain and swelling, if you have any pain and swelling that limits your normal activity, that's considered grade three. So even grade three reactions were high, particularly pain. Um, you know, there was a high degree of that. So a high level of reactogenicity. If you look at systemic symptoms, uh, basically they looked at fever, fatigue, headache, myalgia, shivering. All of these were much more likely to occur with the vaccine, as you can very clearly see, and actually very, very common um, that they would occur. And then if you look at grade three systemic reactions, so these are, again, reactions that will limit your physical activity. They were still more common in the vaccine arm. So fatigue, headache, myalgia, shivering, uh, fever was not more common. Fever grade three was defined as temperature over 39 degrees Celsius. Uh, so all of these symptoms, they lasted about one to two uh, days. Uh, that was the median duration. So when you go to counsel your patients, you know, you do have to advise them uh, of this. So overall safety, there is definitely a higher grade three reactions, about 8% overall in the studies. There was no, no difference in terms of serious adverse events or any potential immune-mediated diseases. This is, again, relevant because of that adjuvant that I talked about. All right, so how do we, in the absence of um, you know, a head-to-head -head trial, how does the CDC decide which vaccine is better? So obviously, they look at the efficacy safety data of, of the two vaccines. Um, one of the other things they look at is how many cases of herpes zoster or post-herpetic neuralgia will you prevent with each vaccine. And essentially, you can see uh, the difference in the two vaccines. So with, with HCSU, you're, much more, you're likely to prevent more cases of herpes zoster, so it makes public health sense to use this vaccine, uh, similarly for post-herpetic neuralgia. Uh, they also did a lot of cost-effectiveness analysis. Um, so, you know, both the, the, the companies that make the vaccines and CDC do their own cost-effective analysis, and there's some differences. There's lots of assumptions that go into cost-effective analysis, but basically what you should take away from this is that uh, this is a cost-effective vaccine. You know, this is the price that they put at for those over the age of 60 and for those over the age of uh, 50, if the cost is um, 315 or less, it's considered to be cost effective. And actually, there were some scenarios where uh, ACSU was cost saving um, in, the, in the older population. Okay, so just a, sort of a head-to-head -head comparison and reviewing everything that we talked about. For ZVL, the efficacy is... Uh, is, you know, I think starkly different, particularly in older uh, patients. So over the age of 80, 18% compared to 91%. Uh, duration of protection, the vaccine effectiveness definitely drops, and it's negligible protection by year 9, 10, I would say. Uh, for ACSU, we don't have vaccine effectiveness after four years, but what we know up until four years that it, it looks pretty good. Um, safety, there have been some rare cases of uh, the OCA strain um, herpes zoster that's in the ZVL that's been reported in the literature, but otherwise it's been a pretty safe vaccine to use. Um, HCSU obviously just came out in the market, so we don't have any real-world data for safety for this vaccine, but we know that it's more reactogenic, um, but there haven't been any major safety concerns. And then cost-effectiveness, under most assumptions, 
um, ACSU is more cost effective than CBL. So what are some of the clinical considerations that are bound to come up once you use this vaccine? So should patients previously vaccinated with ZVL receive ACSU? And the answer is yes, they should. So herpes zoster can recur, and there is some data out there suggesting that it's actually, it re recurs more than we previously thought. So if somebody's had herpes zoster, when can you vaccinate them? There's no data. Um, so the minimal allowable time, um, according to the ACIP, is two months. So you have to wait at least two months since, since receipt of their uh, ZVL. You have to take into account how old that patient was when they got ZVL. So if you think back to the data that I presented on efficacy and duration of protection, if you have an older patient, you can almost assume that the efficacy was very poor of the vaccine, and you can give them ACSU. If it was a younger patient, say a 50-year-old got ZVL, I would probably wait a few years and you know wait till the till that protection is declined, and then give them ACSU. Because don't forget, the older you get, the more likely you are to reactivate a, uh, reactivate herpes zoster, and the more the more likely you are to need that protection. Um, so this is a very small, um, this was industry-funded study, a small open-label study of 430 adults, uh, those who have been previously vaccinated with ZVL uh, at least five years before. So what they basically demonstrated is that it's having ZVL previously does not affect your immune responses. This is not a clinical efficacy study by any means, just basically showing it's safe and it's immunogenic in those patients. There's no theoretical concerns that I can think of um, of why you couldn't use it before five years. So if you have a patient who's had ZVL you know, more recently, they could still get it. They could still get ACSU. It has also been shown to be cost effective. So if you vaccinate patients who have previously been, gotten ZVL, the vaccine still remains cost effective. Um, so that's helpful to know. What about previous herpes zoster? So should patients who have previously had herpes zoster receive HCSU? And the answer is yes. Um, and if so, when there's absolutely no data behind this, is this all expert recommendations? Um, it should be delayed at least until the acute uh, stage is over and the symptoms have abated. I would recommend waiting at least a year. And the reason why I say that there is one small study uh, of not ACSU but ZVL, where they um, where they vaccinated patients within a year of getting herpes zoster episode, and what they found was the immune responses were actually uh, not good. So that was a very small study, not related to this vaccine. Basically, when you get an acute infection, you have a very high uh, immune response, right? You want to wait for things to cool down and then vaccinate. So I would say wait a year at least. Um, what about co-administration with other vaccines? So it is safe for use with the quadrivalent influenza vaccine. There's good safety uh, and immune response data. There's ongoing studies for pneumococcal, PCV13, and Tdap, and this is actually a change from, um, from just within the last month. CDC says it's okay to co-administer these. These studies are still ongoing. The only vaccine where there's no data that I know of is the adjuvant influenza vaccine. I would say that wait at least four weeks, this is what the ACIP says, before and after this vaccine. So don't co-administer with this one, and the reason being two, you're giving two adjuvants, right? Already you know that uh, ACSU is a very reactogenic vaccine. Um, you don't want to give another adjuvant at the same time. And maybe it's okay, but it's, there's no data out there to say that it is. <coughs> All right, what about two-dose compliance? Um, so this is clinical trial data. In clinical, in this, in ZOE 50 and ZOE 70, they have very good compliance, uh, which is not surprising, right? Uh, so around 96% in ZOE 50 and around 95% in ZOE 70. You can imagine in real life that uh, this, the two-dose compliance is going to be lower than this, uh, maybe substantially lower. And then what about those who had those grade three reactions that I talked about? So even in those folks, at least in this clinical trial setting, 91% um, of them completed the second dose. And 90% 90 per, 90 who had a uh, systemic reaction also completed the second dose. So this is important to tell your patients when, if they have a reaction to the first dose. 
So whenever you're going to use this vaccine, please counsel your patients. You are actually by law required to give the vaccine information sheet that the CDC provides. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, counsel them that they may get a fever. They, they will more likely, more likely than not get pain, swelling, redness, um, you know, all of those reactions. And they might get reactions that limit their physical activity for one to two days. And urge your patients to still complete the second dose because, as you saw, um, you know, those patients are less likely to get a grade three reaction with the second dose, and they're more like, they're still like, they still complied with the second dose um, in the clinical trial setting, at least. Um, what about immune compromised hosts? Uh, so, as of now, ACIB gives no recommendation for this population, and that's purely because there's no clinical efficacy data available. There are several studies out there uh, that uh, have immunogenicity data and safety data that's very favorable uh, to the vaccine. So I'll talk about a couple of these, uh, but they've been in, uh, in HIV-infected persons, uh, hematopoietic stem cell trans transplant, solid tumor, malignancy, and transplant patients. Uh, three of these are not published. They were presented at ID Week last year. Uh, but this was one of the first studies that came out actually in 2014 and this was in um, bone marrow transplant patients who had had a transplant within the last 50 to 70 days. And small study, 121 subjects. This is even before they were trying to figure out what adjuvant to use. So they, it had several arms of uh, two different adjuvants and two different doses, so three doses versus two doses. And essentially what they found was that uh, uh, you get a good immune response, uh, even in this very immunosuppressed population and the vaccine was safe. They had four total cases of herpes zoster in this study. Two were in the vaccine arms and two were in the placebo arms. This is data in HIV. This is, uh, again, one of the initial studies and they used three doses instead of two. Uh, so each arrow represents a dose and what you're seeing is uh, GE, specific CD4 responses. So GE, remember, is that glycoprotein and then uh, VZV specific CD4 responses uh, after each three doses. And essentially, again, very similar to the data you saw previously, you get good immune response. And actually, you can see that there's not much difference between dose two and dose three. So after this study came out, uh, all the subsequent studies in, this, in, in immunocompromised populations have used two doses instead of three doses. Um, this is the this is humoral immunity data again demonstrating uh, similar results. All right, so what does the future of herpes zoster prevention look like? Um, obviously, I think there's going to be more clinical efficacy data from in this immunocompromised population. So keep an eye out for that. The recommendations will likely change. Um, this is you know for so many years we haven't been able to use Zostavax in this population, and these remember are the people who are at most risk for developing herpes zoster. So this is really exciting to have a vaccine that, that can be used in this population. There is another vaccine candidate. Um, it's the inactivated formulation of Zostavax that has ongoing um, efficacy trials. It is a three-dose series, uh, so that may be, um, you know, something to look out for. Uh, but it's, it's been ongoing, and there will be some data coming out for that soon. So what are some of the unanswered questions that remain? First is, uh, what is the duration of protection for HCSU after four years? Um, we'll eventually get that data, but for now, I think from that nine-year study that I presented, it's likely that the, the duration of protection lasts that long. Um, what about potential for any unpredictable serious safety event? Remember that adjuvant ASO1B, it's not, used, it's not been used in the real world setting yet, so could there be an unforeseen uh, safety event related to the new adjuvant possible? Uh, what is the optimal timing of vaccination from ZVL or clinical herpes zoster? I'm not sure if we're gonna get a good answer for this. Um, it's one of the unanswered questions. Uh, what is the real world experience going to be like? What is the two dose compliance going to be like? Um, and then because of this sort of unprecedented preferential recommendation, now we only have one manufacturer of herpes zoster vaccine, right? So is anything going to happen to supply issues? What if something happens to GSK supply issues? You know, how will that affect things? So these are some of the unanswered uh, questions. 
In conclusion, so ACSU is now the preferred vaccine to prevent herpes zoster in immunocompetent adults. Um, there are still unknowns, as I talked about, and real-world efficacy, safety, and implementation will be key, I think, in the coming years. <coughs> for some for grumpy cat lovers. Okay, questions? So the question um, is whether Medicare Part B will cover this vaccine. And the last I had heard, it was still going to be Medicare Part D, but maybe that will change. So I think that issue won't go away. That was there for Zostavax in terms of reimbursement. Based on the efficacy data, yeah. So the question is why the vote was so close. Um, and after having listened to these talks for like hours and hours, um, the main concerns that the, the members that voted against it, um, actually the IDSA liaison was against it, um, the AMA liaison was against it, against giving the preferential recommendation. One was there were, there were concerns that there was only one supplier um, of the, and once you give preferential recommendation is, you know, nobody's going to use the, the other vaccine and what will happen if something happens to the supplier. The other issue was safety concerns. Um, the members, you know, raised concerns about the, the new adjuvant and that there, were no, there was not enough real-world experience of the, of the new adjuvant. Those were the main things. And that there was not a head-to-head -head trial um, in the absence. It's actually very unusual for the ACIP to give a preferential recommendation. Um, so it certainly, if you're immunocompromised, you're much more likely to have herpes zoster again. There is some data out there that uh, even immune competent persons can get herpes zoster again, and maybe Dr. Canada, who's seen a lot of immunocompetent adults getting herpes zoster again, can comment on that. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So the question is, um, what about healthcare workers? Should they be getting this vaccine? And actually, I uh, in December or January, in February, I gave this talk at, at the VA, and right after the talk, there were discussions of offering the vaccine to all the healthcare workers at the at the VA. So I think once the because the efficacy of this vaccine is so remarkable, because um, that's been a little bit of a limitation with ZVL, I think people are hesitant to give a vaccine that's not so fantastic and then has all these issues with the live virus. Um, I think there should definitely be a push for for healthcare workers to receive it. Exactly. So in the clinical trials, um, I briefly mentioned this, but there were no potential immune-mediated um, uh, illnesses that were different in the placebo versus vaccine arm. Um, but that concern has been raised about the vaccine. All right. Thank you for listening.